here. My name is Dan Coughlin. I'm the Vice President of Market Development for the American Composites Manufacturers Association and part of the CAMEX team. Uh, ACMA partners with SAMPI for this event every year. Um, would like to welcome everybody to the Composites uh, 201 webinar, um, which will be will feature uh, John Bussell. I'll introduce John in just a minute. Um, before we, I introduce John, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Locke uh, from SAMPI. Uh, Chris is SAMPI's Director of Marketing, Membership, and Education. Um, and it says I can best describe her as a mix of sunshine and a little bit of hurricane. I don't know if that, that goes over that well these days, Chris, but uh, <laughs> maybe not. I'll, turn, I'll turn it over to you to make a few announcements about CAMEX. Indeed. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everyone. As Dan said, I'm Chris Locke, Director of Marketing, Membership, and Education at the Society for the Advancement of Material and Process Engineering. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today and learn more about composites from ACMA's John Bussell. I'm sure you've heard the news by now that CAMEX, the Composites and Advanced Materials Expo, has gone viral. CAMEX is the only Composites and Advanced Materials event happening this year, so we hope you'll join us to get business done and discover the latest in the industry. As of today, you'll have the opportunity to visit over 87 exhibiting companies with more coming in each day. We also have over 100 educational sessions, live demos, interactive displays, and some pretty cool virtual networking um, uh, plans in the works. Um, so speaking of networking, CAMEX will offer real-time networking and community building, live channel chat rooms that provide a space where attendees can learn and grow together with topics ranging from supply chain issues to workforce development, along with some fun topics like favorite quarantine recipes. I'll be providing my recipe for mac and cheese. But first, we have more educational opportunities for you leading up to CAMEX. Virtual tutorials take place before CAMEX on September 8th through the 10th, and two are included with each premium registration package. They can also be purchased a la carte for live or for in-demand viewing. We have six to select from with titles ranging from making a composite part from concept to reality to non-destructive inspection and evaluation for composites and bonded structures. For more information on these tutorials, click on the Educate tab at thecamex.org. The general session and keynote will feature Isabel Gradert, the material fast track leader at Airbus and general advisor for materials technology to the CTO uh, as this year's general session speaker. Gradert will share insights on Airbus's sustainability plan to be the world's first aircraft manufacturer to market a zero emission aircraft by 2035 and will explore how they will get there and the role materials and composite technologies play. To kick off the week, CAMEX has the honor of presenting the 13th administrator of NASA, Jim Bridenstine, for a lively discussion. NASA will be helping, or sorry, excuse me, NASA is helping move the industry forward in these trying times through investments in R&D and technology. Bridenstein will help and highlight the link, linkages between technology advancements in advanced materials and U.S. competitiveness in manufacturing across a range of business sectors. He will wrap up his talk with an overview of NASA's partnership opportunities for businesses in all of all sizes, large and small. So stay tuned for more CAMEX updates by signing up for the CAMEX Connection newsletter, following us on social media, or by checking out our website at thecamex.org. Dan, back to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, exciting lineup of uh, speakers uh, that we have and a, and a program for CAMEX. Um, and obviously, um, in these times of uh, limited travel, uh, welcome. Uh, opportunity to learn, get educated, and to network. Um, and again, for those who are just signing in, I just want to welcome you to the third webinar in CAMEX webinar series on the topic of Composites 201. Thank you all for joining. I would like to make you aware that this session will be recorded and posted on CAMEX website for on-demand viewing. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A feature found on the control panel of your Zoom meeting window, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end. And like I said, if there are some burning questions related to some of the content, um, we, we may, we may uh, flag those um, as, as John does his presentation. 
with that, I would like to introduce uh, John Bussell, Vice President of the Composites Growth Initiative for ACMA. John has over 30 years of experience in market development, composites design, manufacturing, R&D. The list is virtually endless. Um, he has led composites industry programs in existing and new markets, has held a variety of positions in the companies such as S SPI, Market Development Alliance, Brunswick Composites, Martin Marietta, Boeing Wichita, and we now have him at ACMA. Um, he's a fellow in the American Concrete Institute, a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, SAMPI, SPE, and ASTM, and in 2019, Mr. Bussell elected CMA Composites Industry Hall of Fame. So we're all excited to hear Composites 201 from you, John, today. With that, I would like to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. So uh, let's get started. Uh, the objectives of our session today is to build on the information presented in Composites 101. Uh, we're going to have a greater understanding of the composite materials and the properties and the various options to manufacture. We're going to talk about some general guidelines for design, a very high level view. And then lastly, help answer the question why composites, which we somewhat did in 101, but we're going to build on that. So before we get started, we wanted to send out a poll to the audience uh, to get an idea of who all is attending. So. How many years have you been working in the composites industry? Less than a year, between one and three years, between three and 10 years, between 10 and 20 years, and over 20 years. Please take your cursor and uh, select which one of those uh, selections. We'll wait a couple of moments and we will find out uh, what the audience is looking like. So will uh, Central Command put up the results? So we're very evenly distributed. And those 17 people with 20 years of experience, I'm calling on you at the end of this uh, webinar to uh, have you field some of the questions. So with that, let's get started. The outline of uh, my presentation will be on fiber reinforcements, polymers, and manufacturing, similar to 101, but I'm going to go in much more in depth. I'm going to cover a high level view of designing with composites and touch on as a last item, recycling composites. During this webinar, you're, you are going to get bombarded by terms, acronyms, and a lot of uh, uh, products that are used out there. Um, this is not a memory lesson. I just want to expose you to what all the tools that the composites industry has in its toolbox so that we can design and manufacture with these materials to solve a lot of problems. And with that, let's get started. So in Composites 101, we learned a combination of a fiber in a polymer matrix or a resin matrix reinforced with a fiber is the basic definition of composites. And we know that transfer of the load between the fibers is very important and that there's a chemical bond in the matrix. Okay, so there's a review of 101. So let's dive into fiber reinforcements. So starting off with glass, um, you'll find a number of different grades. And on the screen here, I show E-glass and ECR glass. E-glass is a general purpose fiber with good strength and high electric, uh, electrical resistivity. It is probably the most commonly used glass um, in the industry. There's a couple of different forms, single end and multi end, and a lot of it depends on how it is used. So the single end is made uh, for fabrics, uh, it's used in poltrusion and braiding, but multi end is used in chopped mats. So the fibers are chopped and distributed into the rolled goods like we showed in Composites 101. ECR gla glass is a build-on e-glass, but it's boron oxide free, and it has specific corrosion-resistant properties. So you will see uh, 
um, applications where uh, tanks, pipes, scrubbers, even uh, rebar that is used in concrete reinforcement will be made with ECR glass. Then there's other types. There's A glass, H glass, R glass, C glass, and they each have various functions. A glass is lower strength. It is primarily used in a veil or a mat uh, that is used on the exterior surface of uh, composites. An H glass is a higher strength glass. You can kind of understand the connection. Higher strength, H, they were very inventive. Even our glass was, is also higher strength, but it takes on certain different properties, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And then C glass is a barrier, uh, very much used exclusively in corrosion environments, specifically acidic environments, where it's a part of it's made in a non-woven veil that is then matched up with the gel coat, and that provides that corrosion barrier in tanks and pipes and things that are of corrosion nature. Then you have AR a glass, highly alkaline resistant. So if we are taking bare glass fibers and putting them into a high pH environment like cement or concrete, it will do fine. Uh, not all glasses will survive in a high pH environment, but a AR glass will. Then S glass was invented many years ago. It's a structural glass, has higher strength and modulus uh, than R glass, but it has very good high temperature and corrosion resistant. There are three different grades of S1, S2, and S3. Uh, it's primarily made by AGY. Then a very special glass fiber called quartz, 99.99%, it's almost like ivory soap. Uh, pure silica, highly expensive fiber, very low coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, primarily used where radio frequency transparency is needed like radomes, which is the front nose of many uh, of the aircraft that are out there. So John, when you um, look at the various fibers, yes, John, Dan? Uh, we did have a question come up in regards to, you, you gave a great rundown of the different um, nomenclatures for glass and how the, the uh, letters stood for something. The letter E and E glass, does that stand for something that you're aware of? Yeah, electrical grade. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you were to look at a, a property sheet of glass fiber or any of the fibers, um, I just wanted to show you an example here of the comparison of HRS and AR glass. And you could see that the tensile strength will vary even within the glass. So it's very important, and we'll get into this in a little bit more, that the type of glass that you select, you will also need to know the properties and how they perform. And most importantly, one of the things that we keep in mind in designing composites is the coefficient of thermal expansion. And you'll see that there is a, even a range of the uh, CTE of the fibers um, to give you a general uh, uh, comparison the CTE of steel is somewhere around six and a half to seven. Uh, concrete is about six. Uh, so you can see that glass fiber meets up very well with concrete, but you'll notice that the S glass is very low CTE and it's used in special applications. Now, switching on to carbon fiber, pan-based carbon fiber, made using pan precursor fibers, which is the starting point in order to make carbon fibers. Pan carbon fibers are classified in three different groups and it's according to the modulus or the stiffness of that fiber. There's standard modulus SM, high strength. There's intermediate mod modulus IM and high modulus HM. So standard modulus is the most widely used in most applications in the composites industry, specifically industrial applications. It's the most cost effective. Intermediate mod modulus has the characteristic of a good blend of strength and modulus, and it's typically used in aerospace defense applications. And high modulus has a very low CTE, also very high stiffness, and is used in very aggressive environments like spacecraft, satellites, and even enough sporting equipment because somebody wants high performance. 
So if you were to take a look at the stiffness or the modulus and the tensile strength, you can kind of see the difference uh, between standard modulus, intermediate mod modulus, and high modulus. But you'll notice that the intermediate modulus here has a very good high tensile strength as well, whereas the high modulus doesn't have as good a tensile strength. So as you're designing, you need to keep in mind which fibers you wind up selecting. So how are they provided? Uh, small 1,000 filaments to large 60K or 60,000 filaments in a toe. Uh, a toe is a single strand of that fiber, but there's 60,000 filaments in there. Um, it's being used in aerospace to industrial grade. I have a listing of the select products that are used for the standard modulus, as well as all the different products. Then you have intermediate modulus. Uh, it's a smaller range. It's between 6,000 and 24,000 filaments per toe. Um, and there's some recent work on large toe industrial ver uh, versions of this at Oak Ridge National Lab. As a matter of fact, uh, a announcement came out this morning that University of Kentucky is working with Oak Ridge National Lab on development of pitch-based fiber, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. High modulus, small range of toe sizes, 3,000 to 12,000 filaments per toe. So now we're talking about a very, very small, dense fiber. You need a lot of it, but it's also very high performance. So it, selecting the fiber will also impact the uh, uh, type of uh, manufacturing process that you use. The graph on the right just kind of shows you the range uh, of the various fibers and the categories that they're in. So even if they're high stiffness or high strength, there's certainly a number of variations uh, to select from. Pitch-based carbon fiber, where the precursor is not pan fibers, but coal or petrol tar. Um, it's typically low modulus, but it's mainly used in thermal management applications. Um, interesting enough, it has very small uh, amounts of fiber or filaments, uh, 1,000 to 16,000 uh, K in the toe. And uh, there's also the uh, comparison of utilizing these um, uh, fibers with a low cost of precursor. Now, uh, where they're mostly used is in aerospace and even civil engineering, specifically concrete strengthening, uh, where it might be reinforcing or strengthening the concrete or even doing a seismic upgrade. Yes, and interesting enough, golf shafts in sports applications because they're looking for that tensile strength um, in a very economical fiber. Then you have polymer-based fibers. And we talked about uh, generic names and trade names. The generic name would be Aramid. Aramid is a low density, high strength, but a high impact type fiber. And the fiber has a soft failure mode where it doesn't shatter when it impacts or flexes. Um, it has uh, ultraviolet light and moisture absorbent, absorption issues, but you're going to need to use the right resin to build with that. The products uh, are either Kevlar or Twalarn. Now, this chart here compares various fibers, and I just wanted to give you a relative comparison. If we were to take a look at glass, carbon, and aramid, and we look at the various strengths and the various stiffnesses, um, they all have pretty uniform density. Uh, if you were to think of steel, which is 0.28, so it's pretty heavy as compared to glass, carbon, and aramid, especially uh, carbon. But you also need to factor in the relative costs. This is not absolute, but this is to basically tell you that, you know, e-glass is inexpensive, but intermediate uh, modulus carbon fiber is pretty expensive. So as you're designing or as you're considering using, utilizing materials, need to keep the balance of the properties as well as the costs in mind. So other polymer-based uh, fibers, you have polypropylene, uh, commonly known as uh, uh, out there as uh, Anegra fibers. 
Uh, Ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, Spectra and Dyneema are most common. PBO, which is pretty common out there, is Xylon. And LCP, which is liquid crystal polymer. Uh, Vectron is the trade name. They all have their pluses and minuses. Um, they're extremely low density. Uh, some have high resistance to chemicals. Um, you know, it's interesting that the ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene is 40% stronger than aramid fiber. So as you select the various fibers, you may need to think about its performance. Even PBO fibers, they're twice as strong as aramid fibers, 10 times stronger than steel. So you need to compare that with the treatment of the fibers and how you're utilizing that in the manufacturing uh, of these uh, composites for the final product. Other fibers which are considered special would be ceramic and boron. Ceramic is uh, in the forms of silicon carbide and oxide alumina, uh, basically known for high temperature applications. Uh, you see on the right hand side, uh, uh, engine exhaust uh, uh, from jet engines, uh, very common application. Um, and I believe these materials were developed in the 1970s and were utilized in very high ablative um, applications. Boron is a very expensive fiber, very, very specific. Um, it's known for its tensile strength um, and even high compression properties, which is important in certain applications. Now we get into fibers that are natural, and these fibers revolve around environmental sustainability. Typical uh, uh, types of fibers that you can find can be categorized as bast, leaf, seed, core, and grass and reed are combined. Um, and you probably have seen this in literature in the past, hemp, flax, banana, sisal, uh, jute, uh, and even bamboo. Um, there are advantages that they're low density, they're biodegradable, it's a renewable resource, it's a small carbon footprint, they provide good and acoust uh, good thermal and acoustical insulation, good vibration, but there are matrix fiber interface issues and you need to keep that in mind, especially in the selection of the manufacturing process that you select. You don't expect very high low transfer um, and they're not every company is experienced in working with natural fibers. And source of supply can be a challenge uh, because most of these plants are grown in developing countries. So as you look at the selection of these fibers, um, they're usually in a non-woven form. Um, and I will say that probably most notably, they're used in uh, automotive interior panels. And I know that Ford Motor Company has uh, engaged in a, a program over the past five to seven years of integrating natural fibers into their automotive platforms. Other specialty fibers, and this question had come up in Composites 101, so I thought I'd throw a slide in here on graphene. Graphene is a single 2D layer of carbon atoms tightly packed in a hexagonal lattice structure. Boy, that's a lot of uh, stuff to put in one mouth. But these are extremely small fibers. So small, it's smaller than DNA. Its strength is 300 times the, uh, times the tensile strength of steel. It has 20 times the performance and thermal conductivity of copper. In an electrical performance, it could be a semiconductor, superconductor, or even a perfect insulator. Um, its graphene is made uh, several different ways. And where graphene has been used is in things like clothing, golf balls, ink, tires, concrete, asphalt, even fire retardant paint. But in automotive applications, um, it's being used in the engine compartment as a sound attenuating foam in the 2019 F-150 and F-250 pickup and other uh, Ford uh, and Lincoln platforms. So basically, it's the thinnest, strongest material yet discovered, and 
there's a lot of opportunity for this to impact the performance of composites in the future. So let's get on to polymers. In Composites 101, we talked about standard things between thermoset and thermoplastic matrices or polymers, and I'm going to do the same here, but I'm going to drill down a little bit more. With thermoset matrices, unsaturated polyester resin, or UPR, accounts for approximately 75% of the matrix resins used in composites molding today. Uh, vinyl ester um, is a step up if you will, of UPR. It has superior corrosion resistance and very good fatigue resistance. You would often find uh, vinyl ester resins in very corrosive or highly aggressive uh, chemical environments. Epoxy is probably the most widely used polymer in high performance applications because of its superior mechanical properties, even electrical properties to a degree and has served very well in elevated temperature because it retains their strength properties very well, where some of the other resins will start losing their strength um, as temperature is elevated. Urethane is a two-part uh, polymer uh, uh, component that has high flexibility and toughness. So there's a lot of, it, it's very good in impact applications. It's moisture sensitive in its cure, um, so you have to take a little bit more care during the manufacturing process. Phenolic is associated with very good fire resistance. It does have low structural properties, and it's often finding that whether it's being combined with carbon fiber or glass fiber, uh, the uh, fiber volume will be pretty high to make up for those low structural properties in the resin but you primarily use phenolic when you need good fire resistance. Then we get into the higher end of the industry. So high temperature application polymers would be BMI, the smolyamide or polyamide, cyanate ester, and benzoxane. Now in the graph on the right, you can basically see the comparison of cost versus thermal performance. If you're looking for a low cost resin and you're not particularly uh, interested in greatest of thermal performance, vinyl ester would be a good selection. However, if thermal performance is the driver and it's always the driver and cost is not so much an issue, a BMI resin may be the right selection of resins. But here's a nice comparison of where phenolics epoxies uh, and benzoxine uh, fit in into the relative uh, selection here. Then you have hybrids. You always got to like the chemists in the lab. So now they compare uh, a urethane and an ester. Excellent toughness, good water resistance. You have urethane acrylate. So here you want to get into things where it's a higher temperature application. And then if you want impact and energy absorption, now we add some rubber into vinyl ester and now it has a very unique blend of, uh, of materials for certain environments. So the one thing that the chemists have done very well is taking the best attributes of materials and combining them together but each one has a specific purpose. Looking at thermoplastic matrices, uh, this is a big laundry list. Ron? It's, yes, sir. Uh, could we go back quickly to slide 23? We had a question on there about um, the unsaturated polyester resin on that. Yes. So UPR would be to the left and to the bottom of vinyl ester. So it's the most inexpensive and its thermal properties would be probably on par with vinyl ester. Thanks, John, and thank you for your sure. question. Sure. Okay, so we can spend an entire webinar to talk about thermoplastics. But what I wanted to do here was to at least expose you to 
what are the types and how are they characterized? So, so uh, when you look have, at thermoplastic, we had, yes, um, one more question about what is BMI? Bismolyamide. Okay. I mean, it, it's a high temperature resin and much beyond that, I need a chemist. <laughs> I know a lot of things, but I don't know everything. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sure enough. So with thermoplastics, uh, they can basically be structured into a couple of different categories, commodity and engineered slash high temperature. So commodity are things that we pretty much commonly have heard about, polypropylene or PP or polyester, which is PET, and in some respects, nylon 6, nylon 12. Low cost, good performance, um, excellent chemical resistance for each one of these, uh, and made it up with either carbon fiber or a glass fiber. Um, it's pretty much the uh, the run of the run of the mill that you would find with thermoplastic composites. But then when you get into things where you need a superior chemical resistance or high thermal stability or even higher fire resistance, you're now getting into a category of very uh, superior engineered high temperature resins, whether they're polyether imid, uh, uh, PPS, PEAK, or PEC. Um, like I said, this requires probably an entire hour just to unpack this. My intention here was just to give you the comparison of the types of tools in the toolbox that you can select when it comes to thermoplastics. So now we get into uh, manufacturing processes and I'm gonna talk about the process and the product characteristics so you can see why one is selected versus another and some of the pluses and minuses. So in the world of manufacturing, teamwork is important. The design engineer, stress engineer, manufacturing engineer, materials engineer, tool designer, tool engineer, the technicians on the floor, inspection and quality, everybody's gotta work like one big family if things are gonna be successful. So I'm off my podium now, but this is really, really important. In Composites 101, we talked about the various selection criteria, being surface complexity, performance, appearance, size of the part, the production rate, the production volume, and the economic target. And all of that contributes into which processes you would select. We also reviewed in 101, you know, open molding is where one side of the tool surface is, uh, is one side of the tool, uh, where the opposite side of the tool, opposite side of the part was not tooled, where closed mold, molding, there was tool surface on both sides, and there was common, basic, and advanced. And we're gonna go through most of these today, and we're gonna point out the differences between uh, cost, uh, different between the process and what type of products you would get from them. So uh, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about the various manufacturing processes that our composites industry does today that we can select from in order to make pro uh, any type of product. So the ones that are shaded or highlighted in green are ones that we're gonna to touch on uh, the other ones I do not have time to cover. Uh, maybe that's gonna be a composites 205, but that's not for today. So we have casting, which is cast polymer molding, centrifugal casting, filament winding, both prepreg and wet toe, hand layup uh, in, in a standard wet layup or even prepreg, then there's spray up and compression molding, and in compression molding, there's a number of different materials that are utilized in order to uh, take best uh, advantage of the compressor molding process. There's continuous lamination, cured in place pipe, extrusion, injection molding, and injection molding, pretty much everybody understands uh, where it's utilized. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, water bottle here, was injection molded and blow molded, um, but it doesn't have any fiber in there. There's pultrusion, 
RIM, resin transfer molding or RTM, and we'll touch on light RTM, vacuum assisted RTM or Vardum, and it has a number of different names as well. You gotta love it. So if you remember um, the hand layup diagram I showed in Composites 101, um, just about anything, large or small, can be made using hand layup. It's just a matter of materials, time, and the workers. And there's wet layup, vacuum bagging, same thing. Just about anything, large or small, can be made uh, from utilizing these type of this type of a tool or this particular process. And then we have spray up, which is a little bit more automated. It's taking uh, a catalyzed resin and chopping fiber at the same time to be sprayed onto the mold. You would find that with boats, tubs, showers, sinks, and even panels. Uh, so depending on the size and the cost will make a difference. So we look at the process characteristics of hand layup and spray up. The max size is unlimited. The part geometry can be simple to complex. Cycle time is slow, but the tooling cost and equipment cost is low as well. Um, and the surface finish can be as good as the tool is. So in most common applications, you'll find hand layup and spray up, which is one of the more common manufacturing processes in the industry. So the product characteristics, Again, you'll have small to large parts achievable. It's a cost-effective solution. It has been used and continues to be used in prototype to pre even production parts. Um, complicated layups can be made. Um, inexpensive to expensive materials can be used simultaneously. Um, with spray up, it can be automated and not uh, hand applied. But for the most part, hand layup and spray up is highly operator dependent. And there's the potential for wide variations in quality if one does not stay focused on the process. Filament winding, typical things you'll find are utility poles, columns, pipe, missile casings, tanks, stack liners. The diameters can be anything less than 65 feet in diameter. Uh, they can be manufactured horizontally or even vertically. Part geometry is simple. It's a body of revolution. The production volume is low to medium. Cycle time is the same. The surface finish on the inside is good. The outside is fair because it depends on the material, whether it's a wet material, uh, a wet uh, in situ layup, or it's pre -prick. But the tooling cost can be medium to high. And again, a lot of it depends on the size and whether it's being done in the field or whether it's being done in the factory. One of the major characteristics of the product is that it has directional strength. It's computer controlled, so you know exactly where that fiber is going to be. And if you remember from Composites 101, uh, composites are directional in their nature. So if you need strength in a particular direction, the best way to do that is computer controlled. It is low labor because of the automation that's involved. And there might be emission controls if you're not using pre-preg tow material in the product. Centrifugal casting, very similar to spray up, but in this case, it is used for making cylindrical hollow, hollow shapes like tanks, pipes, and poles, where the chopped strand mat and resin is placed on the inside of the mold. So, uh, um, yes, sir. I had a question around the cost that you talked about. Is that per square inch uh, of the finished part? I guess it could be. I guess it could be. Um, you know, it's just a general comparison of what the cost would be uh, relative to other manufacturing processes. Okay, thank you. So uh, in centrifugal fat casting, because it is being uh, manufactured in a horizontal nature, you usually don't find diameters greater than 15 feet. The part geometry is simple. Tooling cost is medium in the effect where it's the mandrel that you're uh, paying for. Uh, cycle time can be low. 
uh, but the surface finish will be good, especially the outside surface. So it's a body of revolution is the product, um, and it's limited in part size, and it's going to be dependent upon the size of the mold and the machine. Again, certain products are, it's a very efficient uh, uh, process because it's like spray up, uh, except it's dealing with certain geometric shapes. Then we talk about compression molding, match metal dies. Now we're into closed molding, right? So compression molding is going to be limited by the press machine. Uh, and there are presses that are six feet, eight feet square. Um, part geometry can be anywhere from simple to complex. The production volume is high. Um, and it's because of the types of materials that, which you, that you would use in the compression molding. Cycle time is fast. Surface finish is good to excellent, but the tooling cost and the equipment cost is going to be high. So as you amortize the materials, I mean, as you amortize the equipment, um, you have to keep in mind for what type of production are you going to be using this for, and it's always used in a high production environment. Um, the nice product characteristics that you would find from compression molding is that the inside and the outside has a finished tool surface. And because of the high volume, you're going to have a lower part per part cost. Um, and if you do the job right um, in a compression molding application, there is low finishing cost. You can often mold the material right to net shape. One thing that's very unique about compression molding is that there's close part tolerances and you can mold in texture uh, and color um, and even connection inserts if needed. So again, uh, one of the things that compression molding does do is support sustainability where you minimize scrap materials that come from the process. Now, there are various materials that you can utilize in compression molding. Sheet molding compound, SMC, bulk molding compound, BMC. With SMC, um, it's basically a mixture of uh, resin, fillers, fiber reinforcement, pigments, stabilizers, thickeners, all in a, uh, um, all in a carrier uh, that is between two plastic sheets that is placed into the cavity when the molds close it squeezes out, if you will, uh, the, uh, the composite charge and out pops out the, the part. Very good in high volume applications. There's high equipment and mold costs um, because of the uh, making sure that you have enough heat in the right applications. And it also depends on the configuration of that part, which would lend itself to higher mold costs. Uh, the process is very reproducible, um, and as I said earlier, directly formed to net shape with integral ribs and bosses is probably the highlight um, in how, to light, how this material system is used in compression molding. You also have BMC, or bulk molding compound, and it's essentially like a putty-like form that is used in injection molding and in BMC applications. Very similar to uh, SMC. Um, a tad bit messier if it's used in, uh, in compression molding as compared to uh, injection molding. But you can mold highly complex shapes. Um, and it's a very low cost alternative, which is very attractive um, in the selection of this process. Ultrusion. Common products that you would find would be bridge decks, rebar, structural profiles, you know, angles, channels, rod, sheet piling, dowel bars, utility poles and cross arms, cable trays. You get the you get the understanding here. The length is unlimited. The width of the tool is going to be its limitation. Very simple to very highly complex part geometries. The production volume can be medium to high, and much of that is going to be dependent upon the resin that is selected and the fiber architecture. How much roving are you using uh, either glass or carbon fiber in that laminate? 
cycle time is medium. Um, it's going to be cured in the uh, in the space of that heated dye. Tool surface is good to excellent. Tooling cost can be medium to high, and a lot of it depends on the complexity of that part. It is a constant cross section. It can only be done in continual le uh, continuous lengths. It is highly oriented in the longitudinal direction at strength. Uh, complex profiles are possible, and if you think of a window lineal or the frame that are made out of fiberglass, um, there are so many detailed uh, shapes to uh, insert the glass uh, from your window as well as all of the spaces for thermal efficiency. Uh, you can do a selection of different reinforcements, so it could be a hybrid, it could be have glass, aramid, even carbon fiber. And innovations that are happening in the pultrusion shape uh, space is that the shapes can now be curved and is probably exemplified by the Corvette bumper. Um, this is a huge uh, uh, focus on composites and uh, it's, you know, most of us have been used to seeing pultrusion in straight lengths, uh, but making it curved, that's a big advancement in the industry. Resin transfer molding, uh, two dyes injected molded in a cavity. There's two different types. There's light RTM and RTM. And the difference here is the pressure. With light RTM, you're using low pressure and it's matched with a low, tool, low cost tooling where RTM is done under high pressure, uh, very sophisticated matched metal tool dyes. So again, uh, how and which one is selected is dependent upon whether you're doing something that is prototype or production. Characteristics, size of the tool itself. So let's call it six foot by six foot would be max. Very complex ge geometry is possible. The tooling cost and the equipment cost is medium. And depending on the geometry, it could even be high. Uh, molded in finishes is the product characteristic. And most importantly, molded in stiffeners and connection points. Uh, this is probably one of the benefits where you want reproducibility uh, when parts are assembled later on. Vacuum infusion processing, or VIP, otherwise known as Vardum, resin infusion, and even the trade name Scrimp, uh, primarily used in boats, marine piling, bridge decks, and architectural products. The max size is unlimited, and part geometry is simple to complex. Tooling costs are generally low. Um, it can be a little bit more sophisticated. Cycle time can really run from slow to fast, it depends on the size, it depends on the resin uh, because of the flow in the part. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Product characteristics, pretty much you don't have any voids. You can get very high fiber volumes uh, used in high strength applications, all different part geometries. And it's possible that you could be manufacturing this in the field, although a controlled factory conditions are preferred. Now, I'm going to touch on very lightly here advanced manufacturing processes, autoclave molding, automated tape placement, automated fiber placement, and additive manufacturing. Any one of these subjects can probably be its own webinar itself, so I'm going to give you a high-level view. We touched on this in Composites 101 with autoclave molding using prepregs uh, and vacuum bagging utilizing an autoclave. Then we didn't touch on this in 101, but we'll do it now, automated fiber placement. Um, here is a very large gantry machine uh, placing individual toe fibers on a, what looks like a semicircular mold here, which represents actually the uh, fuselage um, of an aircraft. And it's uh, placing carbon fiber toe in the direction uh, per the design. Uh, when you see a clean room of this size, a machine of this size, and a very, very, very expensive mold, uh, but you're able to make an entire plane 
or at least a segment of the entire plane in one piece, there's a benefit from it. And you don't have any operator uh, problems because it's all computer controlled and automated. Very similar to automated fiber placement is automated tape placement. In this case, it's not dealing with an individual toe of fiber. You're now dealing with a width of, of tape that could be of the same thickness, but now it has the benefit of placing additional fiber patches um, in areas where there are highly loaded parts of the structure. Again, with the picture uh, on the right-hand side, this gantry shows that um, we can deal with big parts, but the machine itself, computer controlled, in a very clean environment, is very expensive to produce. So in the selection of automated fiber placement, you want to make sure the economics make sense for that. Now, additive manufacturing can be its own webinar in and of itself, and there have been webinars to talk about additive manufacturing, but not all additive manufacturing is alike. Um, as you see from the list here, uh, whether it's 3D printing, digital light processing, fused deposition modeling, and stereolithography, they each have advantages and disadvantages. The biggest advantage is, is that you can do anything from prototype to production, and you can go to such detail that most operators cannot do uh, physically. And then you have something that's called big area additive manufacturing. So now we get into situations where not only are we making parts, but now we can make the tools that will be curing the parts. So the tool that you saw with the automated fiber placement can now be made utilizing additive manufacturing. And that gives an incredible uh, tool to the tool engineer, if you will, uh, to uh, try out and test um, how his design is working. Process characteristics that you'll find from small to large, simple to complex, the tooling costs will be high, the equipment costs will be high. No way to get around it, but it is dealing with very critical structures, dealing with very expensive materials, and you do not need to have an error in any of this. So you need to put the investment in to those processes that will deliver you the best product. So as I said, prototype to full production. Uh, there is an advanced manufacturing. You'll probably find a very long time to qualify the materials on various platforms. Um, you can expect no voids in the laminate, but it is process dependent. You can have high fiber volume uh, uh, applications and large part size, whether it's flat curved or doubly complex contoured it makes no difference. It can be manufactured that way. So I'm gonna give you a very high overview of designing with composites. So strap in because we're gonna go through this quickly. So as a review from thinking from composites, a, uh, from Composites 101, a composite design should not imitate both form and function of an existing design in another material if composites are to offer value, and you need to keep that in mind. We talked about the various composite features that we can design into um, its final performance. So we have short fibers. So why are short fibers used? Uh, a very low cost, high production alternative. Uh, it is very easy to fabricate complex part geometries. And with the randomness of the fibers being placed, uh, you can essentially get to almost an isotropic behavior uh, because of that random. But it's something that it will be easier to analyze if it's, as your designer, um, if you can get to full isotropic behavior. But short fibers has a purpose. But mainly it's low cost and high volume production. Some forms that you'll find are milled fiber, long fiber reinforced thermoplastic, and even chopped fiber. Chopped fiber is what you probably see most in the industry, where the fibers are anywhere from two to four inches long. Milled fibers are much smaller than that. 
um, potentially used in uh, BMC, those type of applications. In many car applications, long fiber reinforced thermoplastic composites are the material of choice. Uh, the fibers are long enough, yet they're short enough so that they can be injection molded um, into various geometries. So with short fibers, you can align them in a particular direction, or you can have a random orientation. With continuous fibers, there's a number of different products that are out there, uh, specifically woven fabrics, and they have a number of different designs, plain weave, basket weave, far, four harness satin. A lot of it depends on which one you select is the drapeability or how the material conforms to the shape and the contour. Again, a different uh, various uh, selections that you can choose from. Even braids, so braids are similar to woven fabrics, but they make cylindrical shapes um, or other cross-sectional preforms. They can be slit, in other words, you can cut that and you can make it a flat shape. Um, and you can see a braided beam that was uh, made utilizing a carbon fiber braid. Non-crimp fabrics are different from wovens. So you see the, the two diagrams below. Uh, the diagram here shows the fiber as it goes up and around the uh, alternate fiber in the opposite direction. So that is what's crimped. With non-crimp, all of the fibers are straight. So what you're going to find is, is that the load carrying capabilities of non-crimped fabrics will be higher than wovens. And you can build into various geometries uh, with standard constructions, whether it's unidirectional, biaxial, triaxial, quadraxial. Uh, I think they run out of axials. Uh, but needless to say, you can place the fiber in the direction that you need. Um, and non crimp fabrics deliver very high load capabilities. Continuous fibers, again, other forms are 3D wovens and pre preg. Uh, you can see the shapes uh, and the tapes that are there. 3D wovens is now the fiber is going in the Z direction. So you're now adding another dimension to the fiber performance. Thermoset composites that you typically will see is E glass and unsaturated polyester resin is the most common. ECR glass with vinyl luster resin for highly corrosive applications. Standard modulus carbon fiber and epoxy, mainly used in aerospace and sporting goods. And carbon fiber and vinyl luster resin used in marine and industrial applications. So these are the common types that you would see that are pulled together. Again, as you look at which products you're going to select, you need to take a look at how they are oriented, whether it's unidirectional or biaxial, meaning that it's in different fiber orientations. So these are all the things that a designer con uh, considers. And with thermoplastics, it runs the gamut from very economical e-glass polypropylene to standard modulus carbon and peak. Uh, all different types of applications. Uh, again, uh, that peak aircraft door fitting is a unique uh, application and it replaces many different metallic aluminum parts in aircraft design. So if you look at the advantages and disadvantages of properties, high specific strength and stiffness, inherently corrosion resistant, high durability, flexibility in design and production are the uh, sweet spot of composites as you look at the world of other materials. And the purple, uh, icon, purple uh, shapes in these diagrams show where composites fit with the world of materials. However, its disadvantages, and depending on what you're selecting, could be the stiffness, flammability, moisture, cost, and even the acceptance, the learning curve by designers to accept those properties. So again, we can unpack this. I just want to basically say that how you select your materials in the manufacturing process there's always a good solution to come out with. Now, I have two more slides that I just want to pick on recycling composites, because again, it was a question that came up in Composites 101. So can composites be recycled? Yes. Opportunities to recycle? 
uh, in process while it's being manufactured and certainly at the end of the service life. There's many different processes that can be used to do it, whether it's mechanical grinding, thermal in the form of pyrolysis, thermochemical in the form of solvolysis, electromechanical, and actually any combination of these, but there are advantages and disadvantages of each. I'm not gonna unpack that here. Thermoplastic composite materials can be shredded and recycled by melting, but the supply chain is limited. So as we think about recycling composites, there's a certain business proposition that goes along with it. Glass fiber, it's about volume. Carbon fiber, it's about value. And certain existing markets today are exploring how composites can be recycled for their end use applications, specifically wind, aerospace, automotive, and marine. Cement coprocessing, otherwise known as cement kiln, is one of those successful opportunities for recycling composite scrap. But most importantly, establishing the recycling supply chain to collect, sort, process, and deliver composites is gonna be very important. The market pull from the end user in wanting to utilize recycled composites, standardizing how we process, select, and use these materials, and most importantly, the composites industry needs to think and design for sustainability. So that cannot be underscored. So with that, I wanna thank the following people for helping contribute to the content of this presentation. Trevor Grunberg with Vectorply, Andrew Polkawalk, my colleague at ACMA, Steve Rogers at Emergitech, and my, my big kahuna, Dan Coughlin at ACMA. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, you covered a lot of ground there uh, in a short period of time. I'm sure the folks out there have a few questions for you. Um, please submit those via the Q&A box. We have had a few questions come in. Um, so um, question about the resin and fiber placement. How do they work um, in terms of additive manufacturing or 3D printing? Um, how do they come together, John? Yeah, so that's, that's the portion that I, I flew over uh, because that is a very uh, uh, detailed question. So if you think of a nozzle and any sort of nozzle, there are feeds in that nozzle of a resin and in some cases a fiber where it is then distributed in a particular pattern that is based on the computer path that is selected for that additive manufacturing application. The fibers are short fibers, they're not continuous fibers, so placement of the fibers is very specific. Most of the additive manufacturing that is done out there utilizes a thermoplastic resin However, there are recent advances of using thermal set resins. And, you know, there's pluses and minuses of what materials you would use. Uh, but needless to say, it's very, very sophisticated to dis deposit the, the resin and the fiber in a precise pattern and making sure that that pattern follows a particular path that allows for cure and allows for placement. So that's very important when it's done in the manufacturing process. Thanks, John. Um, and, uh, you know, I just also wanted to point out a lot of what you covered in the presentation at the overview level. There will be a number of sessions focusing on this uh, during CAMEX, um, including additive manufacturing, advances in materials, bonding and joining, uh, design and analysis, uh, sustainability, recycling, manufacturing process technologies, various market applications for the technologies that John has talked about. And really, um, you haven't had much time to go into that um, in this presentation, but of course, you could probably give an entire tutorial just on the market applications for just a few of these uh, technologies. Um, you know, non-destructive evaluation and testing uh, also is a, is, a, is a very hot topic. Um, 
John, just to talk about um, as we uh, pull in uh, a few more questions here, um, how do you overcome weakness in uh, Z direction in the additive manufacturing? And I, I know um, that has come up. And in fact, I had some personal experience with that. They, they created um, a little um, sort of tube to put on the pin on golf courses to lift the ball out of the hole so you didn't have to touch the pin. And it was 3D printed. Um, and what, but one of the problems was they came apart because it was built in layers, they came apart um, in the Z direction. So great question. Um, how do you overcome the weakness um, between the layers in the Z direction and additive manufacturing? Um, you know, uh... It, that is a challenge. Um, part of it is the bond of fiber to the resin. You know, as I said, when a nozzle is passing over uh, components within additive manufacturing, it is disp it's placing the material at the temperature where it is soft and manageable, but it is controlled where you know how long it's gonna to take to cure. When you add the fiber in there, you have the potential to not only uh, provide a bond uh, in an XY fashion, uh, fashion in the plane in which the materials are being distributed, but what has now has to change is the geometry so that as it goes vertical, it now takes on the stiffness that's required. You know, it's a very, it, I think this is an evolving part of additive manufacturing uh, we're seeing today. Um, and I have to scratch my head a little bit right now. Uh, I've seen additive manufacturing with concrete and developing the base for wind turbine um, installations. And recognizing how much load goes into the base, I'm trying to figure out how do you get the appropriate uh, reinforcement and stiffness in the concrete as you're having a lot of weight above that base and how do you get that stiffness? And you do that by the geometry of the wall. If you go back to uh, composites 101 when we talked about sandwich panels and we talked about the face skins taking the tensile stresses and the core taking the shear stresses it is how you design that core that will take the shear um, I there's not necessarily a universal answer uh, but uh, part of it is cure part of it is geometry that will attempt to solve that problem, but I don't know necessarily if it does. Yeah, I think there's also advances, there are advances occurring in terms of having the additive manufacturing, 3D manufacturing be less layer by layer and more um, three-dimensional in terms of how the fibers and the resins are placed. Um, so I think that's another solution, uh, coming forward from the, from the equipment side, the process technology side of the industry. Um, another question came in. I know there's been a lot of interest around this. Um, and, uh, the question is about curved poltrusion. Um, could you touch on why that would be so revolutionary, the benefits, uh, in terms of applications for curved poltruded parts? Well, um, curve poltrusion came about specifically to address very stiff members in a body in white uh, for automotive applications. Uh, and in automotive, there, other than the chassis, uh, which would be very straight lines, everything else has got a curve or a some sort of a gentle surface to it. Um, the problem with 
in, or the challenge that became for Poltrusion was how do you pull the fibers which are wet through a dye and knowing that it's going to cure within the space of the uh, uh, the size of that dye and allow the fibers to articulate around any particular curve uh, sol uh, curved uh, uh, contour yet be not fully cured but cured enough to allow to do it without distorting the fibers. Uh, very, very, very sophisticated as a matter of fact uh, Shape Corporation um, is the one that makes the product for the uh, Chevrolet Corvette and that poltrusion machine is vertical versus horizontal and I thought that was very you know mind-boggling at first but why not have gravity take give you the benefit and um, allow you to curve uh, those profiles. Now, I think unlike what you see in steel uh, with uh, tubes and maybe structural shapes, the properties from a structural application um, have yet to be determined. Again, fibers when they're straight uh, and when they're locked into a particular geometry perform well. But now that you curve those fibers, they'll probably be very good in compression versus tension. Um, but now you need to change the geometry. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, the industry did back in the late 1990s was we understand why steel is made the shapes that they are, because that was an easy way to roll molten uh, steel uh, and to take out as much weight as possible, recognizing the density of steel. It's not necessarily the most efficient shape for composites. And during several uh, research uh, 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 programs, we identified that shapes like trapezoidal, hexagonal shapes were much more efficient for composites. Uh, and to take greater load than steel would ever would in those typical manufacturing operations. But now you have to get over that acceptance. I had the one slide is uh, end user acceptance. Um, it was very difficult in the very beginning to teach a civil engineer that that I-beam that he's now known can be replaced by something that looks like a hexagon and outperform it. So it's a matter of understanding how the fibers are then working for you to carry the loads. So uh, it's a very significant thing to do curves. Okay, thanks, John. And, and we're, we're at 2.15, so we are gonna take a few more questions, but for those who are signing off, I do want to uh, thank you all for participating in this session. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to fill out the contact form on the CAMEX website and CAMEX will follow up. Make sure to register for the CAMEX 2020 virtual to learn more about composites and all the topics that John talked about today and more. You will receive an email follow up with a 10% discount for the CAMEX virtual event. I hope to see you all there. Um, so we'll answer a few more questions here because um, they are still coming in. Thank you for your questions. Um, can you talk about when you would use, John, a non-woven veil over a woven veil? I would use a non-woven veil when it is a specifically a corrosion barrier. Um, the veil itself is not taking any load. It is there as a barrier. It's there, and specifically when it's a veil, it is um, providing structure to a gel coat, which is a resin uh, barrier. Um, so it 
lends itself to a function of corrosion. It also lends itself a function to cosmetics. Whereas a woven um, is going to take more in a load um, application. Um, but I personally haven't been involved with many uh, non-woven veils that um, have done that. Yeah, and obviously we will have um, a chat feature uh, during CAMEX. Uh, you can visit many of our exhibitors uh, to talk about these in more detail. I would recommend um, you know, chatting with the folks uh, who supply uh, fiberglass. Uh, can talk to you more about those applications um, during CAMEX. Um, another question came in regarding, can you elaborate on the difference between non-crimp fibers and woven fibers? Okay, so um, let me try to figure out how to best explain this. Non-crimp fibers, are taking uh, bundles uh, of tow that might be to the order of 24K uh, bundles that are essentially laying those fibers or those toes in a particular pattern in a flat plane. So it lends itself, and if I can go back to, whoops, if I can go back to this one picture, um, you can see that, you know, if each of these toes are placed next to each other and then placed on top and stacked, that's providing the ability for the fiber so that when it is uh, uh, reacted in tension, you're taking the full uh, component and advantage of the fiber and its maximum tensile capability. When it's woven, and if you try to pull axially left to right, you now have a bind with the fiber that is going you know, left to right, that it's never gonna get fully straight and you're never fully going to get the tensile load out of that. So it's a matter of, it's a couple of things. One is how much is the load transfer of that particular fabric um, for the application? And the other thing is how much contour is there with that, um, uh, with that application. I've seen more stitch bonded where the fibers are in, in, the, in this particular fashion on flat surfaces versus woven products here that would be more in drape. Uh, so you're dealing with contour and shape that probably lends itself, the geometry lends itself to more strength than the actual fiber itself. I don't know if I exactly explained what the uh, uh, asker was looking for, but that's essentially the differences between the two. Sure, and, and people are welcome to follow up and submit, submit um, to the site. And uh, also uh, the exhibitors, we have a camera very knowledgeable in these areas, help you. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in regarding calculation of energy to cure the composite um, by oven versus autoclave and the curing cycle uh, for a convective method. Um, I think those are very good questions. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind submitting those and providing some more background, I think we'd like to answer those in, uh, in written form. Uh, and again, uh, the folks supplying autoclaves um, at CAMEX and other process equipment uh, will be very helpful, but we'll get back to you on those uh, in writing if you want to submit those and maybe provide a little more background what you're looking for so we give you the right question. And uh, I think we have one more question here, John, around foam materials that are blends of PVC and aromatic 
polyurea, can you provide some insight on what is helping to carry the load and what is needed for chemical stability? They're really throwing uh, some questions at I, you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. And uh, I would have to uh, knee jerk and probably look at a uh, core material supplier to help with that. Okay. I think part of the answer is density of the of the uh, of the foam, and part of it is the uh, uh, the chemistry of the foam uh, chemical that is being used. Uh, but I really don't exactly know the answer to that. Um, there was also a question that came in. I'm not quite sure if we have enough background in terms of what you're looking for there. But there's a question around. Uh, how much the strengths vary in practice from the, and in this case, the word is pristine fiber strength. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for if you're looking for strength in the matrix, which is a whole discussion around sizing and uh, wetting, or if you're looking for the actual variability in fiber strength itself. So if you want to submit that question uh, via the CAMEX website, um, we'll try to get back to you on that. Um, and I think uh, I think the answer to part of that question was when I showed the uh, spec sheet for glass fiber, and I highlighted the tensile strength. It was lined up with pristine tensile strength, and that happened to be the the wording that was used on that data sheet. Um, and it's probably the only time I've ever come across the word pristine. Uh, <laughs> But I would probably say it's meaning in an absolute perfect uh, uh, situation. And again, it's only talking about the fiber. It's not talking about the composite. The composite is the fiber and the resin, right? So it's only talking, I think the reference there is that it's only talking about the fiber components. And sometimes people often uh, swap out the strengths of a fiber with the strength of the composite and that is a very big difference. John, you have answered sure. quite a range of questions today. Thank you so much um, for, for providing uh, Composites 201 today. Um, that was a real journey across the Composites universe um, at the 201 level. So you all uh, receive uh, a email follow-up with a 10% discount for the CAMEX virtual event. Hope to see you there. Please submit your questions to the CAMEX website again. Please visit our exhibitors. Attend the sessions uh, to learn more about composites. Thank you everyone today and we will see you at CAMEX the week of September 21st. Have a great day everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.